Hello, church. I want to thank you guys so much for joining us online. Let me first start by telling you how much I love you, how much I miss you. Uh, I can't wait till we're back uh, in our building and uh, we're able to have a, a face-to-face conversation right here in person, give you a big old hug. But I do really do appreciate the fact that we have this incredible technology that allows us to be able to do church uh, online right now during uh, COVID-19. But I do just thank you so much for taking the time to hang out with us and uh, just appreciate that. Now, if today is your first time uh, being here with us at Unleashed, joining us here today, we want to thank you so much for joining us as well. And uh, again, we pray that today will be a blessing to you. Uh, but the other thing we also want to do is, uh, is we want to connect with you. So as you're connecting with us through the message today, 
today. We would love to connect with you as well, send you some information on the church. Uh, the best way for us to do that is through either uh, text or email. We would love to send you some quick info. Uh, so actually in the uh, in this post, you can click on a link that'll take you to our connection card. If you fill that out, it's not, there's not a lot of information. It's just your name, email address, uh, phone number. We'll send you out some quick info. And listen, there's no strings attached. We just want to keep you up to date on some great stuff happening here at the church and uh, and the messages that are coming up uh, as well. So again, we just want to thank you uh, for being here. You know, today we're going to continue on in our series that we started last week. The series is called Bigger. And uh, we're talking about how God is bigger uh, than a crisis. And uh, we have a, a very big God, very powerful God. And so we're talking about the peace that we can have in the middle of the storms that come into our life. Now, the message for today is called Trusting God Through Trouble. See, right now we're going through a storm. We're going through some difficult times. Um, there, you know, with COVID nineteen, and there's so many people that are affected. Uh, whether it's it's through uh, getting sick or whether it's through uh, you know financially, right? You know, there's a lot of impact right now, uh, not just in 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 our local community, but also the world at large. So we're going to talk about how we can trust God through times of trouble today. But before we get into that, would you please pray with me? Father God, I just want to thank you so much for all the people that, uh, that are joining in right now. Father, for the fact that uh, as a church family, we can still come together. We know that we can't be here in person together, Father, but right now we're joining together in spirit. Father, your Holy Spirit is all right there right now. So I pray that as we talk about this very important subject, that we can have some clarity, that we can have some peace and some comfort. Father, right now, that if there's someone that's going through a tough time and they're asking the question, you know, how can all this bad stuff be happening? And where's God in all this? I pray, Father, that today we're going to answer that for them. And they're able to see that you're a loving father right there for your kids. And we thank you so much for that promise. And again, Father, help us today to have an open heart, open mind to the message. And because of that, we're going to be impacted for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what I want to do really quick is uh, we actually have teaching notes for this message. So if there's a time to pause, right now would be a perfect time to pause uh, this message um, because you can uh, go over to the comment section and you can click on our teaching notes, go print those out and you can follow along or grab your Bible, grab a pen, grab, grab a notebook, and we're going to go right through that, okay? So go ahead and do that right now. All right, so thank you guys so much uh, for, again, being here. We're going to talk today about trusting God through times of trouble. Now, if you think about it, when it comes to the area of trust, it's really simple to trust when everything is great, when everything is perfect. It's easy to trust God when things are good, right? I, I see people putting stuff online uh, where they put a hashtag, right? they put a hashtag blessed, and, and, and if you look up that hashtag, there's, all, there's people that are putting on like, hey, I got this jewelry or I got, you know, uh, I got this new car, this new house, right? It, and, and the whole thing behind it is, is, look, I'm blessed. I'm so happy. And, and it's easy to trust when everything is going perfect. But how hard is it to trust when things aren't going perfect? How hard is it to trust when Maybe we don't have the right, the, the, the right resources to provide for ourselves. Maybe we're having some financial problems. How hard is it to trust when maybe we're going through a health issue with maybe like right now COVID-19 or we have a family member that's been affected by it. I've talked to quite a few people lately that, that have family members in other states that are impacted by this. And, and it's hard to trust during those moments. I've talked to people that have, had, have health issues outside of COVID-19 right, that, that, that are going through issues. I've, I, I talked to someone that had nothing to do with COVID-19 and had just lost someone. Those are tough, tough moments. You know, how hard is it to trust God for, and God's goodness when maybe with the relationship that we thought was going to last with someone, with our loved one, and, and things begin to fall apart? It's hard to trust sometimes. And But here's what we've done, is that trust primarily in our society, is all based on the physical. Like, I will trust if all the physical stuff goes perfectly. So what I'm hoping to do today is this, is I'm hoping to give you another perspective when it comes to trust, and I'm hoping to show you how God is a God that we can trust, a God that loves us. And even through the middle of these storms, God never leaves us and never forsakes us. 
We have a God that is always right there for us. Now, when it comes to problems and issues, let's admit there are times when we understand, okay, right now this issue, this problem is understandable why I'm going through it, right? That there's a consequence for our behavior. Because let's admit, if we do something bad and there's a consequence for it, that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, if we go and do something dumb and uh, we end up hurting ourselves, we, that doesn't surprise us, right? Uh, when, when I was a teenager, um, I decided to jump off a roof. I won't even get into the details as to why. I just, let's just say I wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, okay? So I jumped off a roof. I ended up hurting my ankle really bad. And what was interesting is this, is that even to this day, to this day, 30 years later, to this day, there are times when my ankle aches, my ankle hurts, when I, when I go for a run or a sprint, and all of a sudden I feel like a, a little bit of a pain. But I got to tell you, it doesn't surprise me. Why? Because I did something dumb. See, when, when we do stuff, we aren't surprised when bad things happen. But what about when you're doing things right? What about when you're following Jesus with everything you've got? And from all that you can tell, everything you're, you're doing everything possible to do the right thing, to, be in, to, to impact people. And you're going through all of that. And, and it is during those moments that we ask the question, why is this happening? If I'm trying to do everything right, why does bad stuff still happen? And it is during those moments, I want you to know, that that is when faith and trust is actually put to the biggest test. When we feel like we're innocent, we're doing everything right, and things are still falling apart. And that's when it's put to the test. And we're going to talk about that today. But see, but part of the issue is that there's a misunderstanding. People believe that Jesus, when he came into this world, that he came so that we would have comfort. But that's not what happened. Do you know that Jesus never promised us that we're not going to have problems in this world? Oftentimes people believe that, 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 that Jesus came so that we will never have problems in this world. And, and that's actually not accurate. Uh, but I, I do want you to know this, that Jesus did come so that we could overcome the problems, and Jesus did come to give us peace in the middle of the problems. Listen to this incredible promise that Jesus makes us here in John chapter 16, verse 33, where it says this, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace in the world you have tribulation. You're going to have problems. He says, look, in this broken world, you're going to have problems. But take courage. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. He says, in this world, you're going to have issues. You're going to have problems. He says, but take courage. I've overcome that. And if you're a follower of me, you're an overcomer as well. But he didn't say we weren't going to have issues. Now, the one thing he also said there was this. He said that in him, we may have peace. Now, you notice he said, you may have peace. This isn't automatic. See, people want to just have peace, period. But Jesus says this, that peace is not just automatic. Peace is offered, and we have to accept it. And the way we accept it is by giving God that thing. You know, let me show you what I mean. There have been times in my life where I've been stressed about certain situations, certain things. And here's what I've realized, that whenever I've become overstressed about something, now what I've done is the first thing I do is I step back and ask myself, is this in Christ? Or am, am I relying on Jesus, who's the overcomer of all? Or am I relying on myself and my ability and, and my strength? Because that's when I feel overwhelmed. So I step back and ask, is this in Christ? Because in Christ, he says there, you have peace. You don't have to have fear. You know, and a great question that I'm asked often, especially during things like this with COVID-19 or when someone's going through a tough time, uh, when someone you know, has a family member or themselves are in the hospital and I go, we go and talk to them, or whether it's a, a, you know, a funeral, a memorial service, people ask the question, you know, pastor, why is it that bad things happen? Why is it that bad stuff happens? This person was a good person. You know, why is it that, that we have the brokenness that we have? Why is it that we experience all of this? You know, why is it that we have problems in this world? If God is so loving, which he is, if God is so good, which he is, then why do bad things happen today? That's a very valid question. 
And that's an important question to answer. That's a deep question. I want you to know that. I can spend hours talking to you about this because I've done a big study on this because I needed to know. When I first came to Jesus, that was my biggest stumbling block was I needed to find out, okay, God, if you're so good, then why is it that I had so much brokenness in my life? And maybe that's a question that you're having as well. And so, so I need to find that out. And one thing I've realized was this, is that as we look at the character of God, we find hope and meaning and purpose and, and strength. But as we look at the character of God, it also explains why some bad things happen today. Let me show you what I mean. If you look here in Hebrews chapter 6, 18, it's talking about God's holiness, how God is perfect. I want you to know God is holy. He is perfect. And listen to what it says here. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, it says this. It is impossible for God to lie. He, uh, we, have, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement. It says that because God can't lie, we have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. That we know that we're going to be okay. And we know we're going to be okay. We can be encouraged by that. Why? Because God can't lie. And if God says, I will encourage you, I will strengthen you, I will give you the power and the direction for your life, that God will do that. And then it says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. This is what holds it all together. A hope both sure and steadfast. It says it is an immovable hope. It is a hope that is strong. And, and that hope, meaning, and purpose that we have in our life, the reason we can have confidence, the reason we can have confidence that when we die in this life, that death is not the end, there's continuation on in heaven, the reason we can have comfort in that is because God told us, and it's impossible for God to lie. Now think about this. This is what I love about God. This isn't about religion. It's about a relationship. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of us would love to be in a relationship with someone that was totally honest with you, loving and honest? Right now, all of you at home went, yep. And if you didn't raise your hand physically, you, ra you rose it spiritually, right? Because you know, you're like, yes, of course. I want someone who's going to love me and be honest with me. That's what makes a great marriage. That's what makes great relationships. That's why you have those friends that are, that are going to be there. They're going to they're gonna love you, but they're going to be honest with you. Uh, my wife is very honest with me. I love that. She's honest in telling me how much she loves me. She's also very honest about when I'm wrong. I don't like that honest. I'll be honest as much as I like the honesty of, I love you, you're so incredible. You know, but, but there's the other honest as well that says, hey, Juan, I'm going to be honest with you because this isn't okay. See, but that's what makes a great relationship. God is always honest. See, as people, we're not always honest. We, we make mistakes, right? Sometimes we're, there's fear, so you're not, you're not going to be 100% honest. Whatever. But, but here's the thing about God. God is not afraid of anything or anyone. Therefore, God has no reason not to be honest. God is honest. It says there, it's impossible for him, for him to lie. There is one thing God can't do. He can't lie. And I love that about him. Because when he makes me a promise, it means his promises are true. When he tells me and tells you, I knit you together in your mother's womb. I knew you before your parents did. When he tells you, I have a plan for you. I have a purpose for your life. You were made for so much more than just waking up in the morning, working and going back to sleep and just wasting away days. He says, I have big plans for my kids. And when he makes us the promise that he loves us unconditionally, when he tells us that even though we've gone in the wrong direction, Romans 5.8, he tells us that he demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He says, I love you unconditionally. We love that about God. See, the fact that God can't lie, that God's character is holy and perfect and pure, we love that. It's the hope 
the steadfast, immovable hope. But I want you to know, it's also why we have issues today. Because listen, if someone is honest with you, you also have to know that when they warn you about something, that they're being honest about it. God warned us of all the bad in our world. He's, you know that when it all began, God created a place called the Garden of Eden, which was a perfect place. Perfect. No death, no sickness, no mourning, no tears. All that's a perfect place in the Garden of Eden with, with Adam and Eve. It says that God, God dwelt among them. It was a perfect place. And God says, look, you can live here forever. No issues, no problems. You're taken care of. But God said, but here's all you have to do is you have to, you have to obey me. Don't do that. You can eat from anything else. You can do all this other stuff, but just stay away from that one thing. The one thing. And what did Adam and Eve do? <laughs> Went straight to the tree. You see, now, now we look at that going, why do they do that? You and I have done that. Let's admit, God has warned us for a long time about the actions of our lives, and, I, and, and yet we stumble. We sin. All a sin is, is doing something God asked you not to do. We've all done that. Why? Because we have a sinful nature. There's, there's this thing in us that wa wants to do what we want to do. But God said, look, you have the right through free will to do what you want to do, but you also know there's a consequence that goes along with that. And listen to the consequence that he said here to Adam and Eve and to all of us here in Genesis Chapter 2, verse 17, it says, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. It says, you can have everything else, stay away from that. But if you do that, no, you're going to bring death. You're going to bring problems into this world. The Bible tells us that even the whole earth groans and, and wants to be made new again. So all this stuff is going to happen if you choose to reject me. And guess what? We did. And you want to know what's crazy is that what this means is that we ruined God's perfect creation. We made the mess of God's perfect creation, and now we're angry at God about it, even though he's not the one that did it. This would be the equivalent of, let's say that you're, you warn your children. If you have kids, you warn your kids about safety things, right? I've told my kids, you know, be careful. Don't jump over the couch like that because you're going to hurt yourself. Uh, you know, we tell our kids, don't shove a fork in an outlet, right? Don't do that. It'll give you really cool hair, but it's going to hurt you, right? We tell them, stay away from that. Why? Because we love our kids. When we warn them, it's not to take something away, it's because we understand that, yes, that thing is so powerful and it's going to hurt you. Now, imagine if you tell your kid, stay away from the light socket with a the fork. They go and shove a fork in the light socket. They get electrocuted. They come back and they start yelling at you and they're angry at you saying, look at the pain that I went through. Look at the pain that you caused on me. You know what you would say? I didn't do it. I warned you. See, we live in a society today that is constantly shoving the fork in the light socket and angry at God for the pain that they're feeling. And God's like, stop putting the fork in the light socket. Stay away from that. The Bible tells us that there's also a deceiver, an enemy, Satan, the devil, it's funny because a lot of people don't like to talk about the devil. They don't like to talk about Satan. And sometimes people go, well, I don't really believe in the devil. I, I believe in God, but I don't believe in the devil. You can't believe in God and not believe in the devil because God says and refers back to the devil and tells that there's an enemy, like a, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That the whole first, you know, with Adam and Eve, it wasn't just them. It was the enemy putting seeds of doubt into their mind that caused them to go in the wrong direction. And he does that with us today. And so, so all the brokenness that we see is because of us falling into the temptation from the enemy, and we made a mess. But here's what I love about God. Even though we made the mess, God, like a good father, helps his kids clean up the mess. Listen to what it says here. In 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it says this. If my people who are called by my name, God's kids, 
who are called by his name. See, my kids are called by my name. So it's saying there that if my people who are called by my name, my kids will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. He says that they, they, they want to come and spend time with me and turn from their wicked ways. They fix those things in their life. They quit putting the fork in the light socket. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins. We don't have to walk with that sin, with that brokenness anymore. And I will heal their land. God says, I will take care of the problems and the issues. God says, look, you can turn back. That verse reminds us that we have a heavenly father with open arms, ready to bring his kids home, ready to embrace you with his comfort, ready to embrace you with his peace. He says, look, I know you made the mess. I want to help you clean it up. It's like that whole Jerry Maguire from back in the day. God is saying this, help me help you. God wants to help us. Listen, if you have children, I remember when my kids were little and they were, they were, when they were tiny, now they're all teenagers and grown up, but when they were little, it's the most amazing thing. They were the cutest little things. But one of the things that was crazy is they were so little and yet they can create such a big mess just like that. You know this, if you got kids. I mean, it was the wildest thing. We just let them play. And if, I mean, literally, they could be for five minutes playing. Just mess everywhere. I'm like, what in the world? And I would tell them, okay, you got to clean that up. Now, cleaning up, just so you know, it's not as fun. So we try to do some creative things, right? Clean up, clean up, everybody, everywhere. It didn't work, right? They were just like, um, yeah, that's not that fun anyway. That song doesn't help at all, right? But, but so we try to find creative ways to do that, you know? But, but here's ultimately what happened. There were some times when the mess was so big that my three, four, five-year-old couldn't do it on their own. It was literally going to take them, even though it took them five minutes to make it, it was going to take them five years to clean it. So you know what I did as a father? I wasn't angry. I didn't say, you do it yourself. You created the problem. I never said any of that. I sat with my child, sat on the floor, and helped them clean up the mess that I did not create because that's what a good father does. And that's what our heavenly father does. God is right there for us. See, we can trust God through trouble because God, he can't lie. And he says, I'm going to help you clean up the mess. Do you know what trust means? The definition for trust is this, is to allow someone to do something without the fear of the outcome. That's what true trust is, that you're going to allow someone to do something and you're not going to fear the outcome. You're trusting that it is going to be okay. Now, now that's an issue for a lot of us because what that means is we have to give up some control. Now, if you're like me, type A, we can be a little control freaks, right? We, we like to have control and it's hard to let go of control. And, and part of the reason that it's hard to let go, especially is, is that is if you've been hurt in the past, right? Maybe you trusted someone and you let them do something and they dropped the ball, so you took it back. And you trusted someone else and they dropped the ball and you took it back. And someone else, they dropped the ball and you took it back. So because of that, then it developed this thing inside of us, a spirit that does not trust And so therefore, we feel like we've got to be in control. But this says this, that we've got to learn to trust God to say, God, you're in control. I'm going to give you control. And and here's the beauty of this. God never fails. God is perfect. We fail. And people have failed us. But we can trust God because God never fails. He'll always do the good thing. Isn't that amazing? See, God will always do good in our life. Now, it might not be what we want, right? When my kids were little and they did something wrong and I disciplined them, guess what? They didn't like it. They didn't like it. They didn't understand it. Now, as they've grown older and they see kids who are acting up all crazy, like, oh, man, I'm so glad you disciplined me because it helped me. It directed their character right? And so, so the thing is, this is God loves us as his kids and directs our character. But see, the reason we don't have to fear any problem, any issue, it's not based on our character. It's based on his. He is holy. He is perfect. He is powerful. And he is loving. And he's right there for us.
The other thing that God does, God actually can also bring purpose through the pain. God can bring purpose to the pain, but it all depends on how you see it. See, it's all about perspective. It's how you view pain. See, we look at pain from a physical perspective. It's just the outside. Here's, what, here's what's going on. But God says, let's look a little deeper. And he asks us to search deeper. Listen to what it says here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. It says this, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, may be opened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. It says the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. He says there, look, I, I want the heart, the, the eyes of your heart to be open so that you can know that there's hope. See, hope is, is anticipation for a better future. He says that, that, that when you can see it, not just the physical pain now, the physical problem now, because it's easy to just stare at that and give up hope. He says, I don't want you to just look at it from your eyes. I want you to look at it from your heart, knowing God, knowing God's character, knowing how you are loved by God. You're a child of God. And because of that, there is hope. You know, he wants you to look through it from, from your soul perspective. See, life is more than just the physical is what we're being reminded of there. Now, let's admit, that's easier said than done. None of us like the storms. None of us like problems and issues. I, I, I don't like them. I got to tell you, I don't like them. But here's one thing I've come to realize is that sometimes we need the storms. We do. You see, there's this belief out there that if you follow Jesus, you're never going to have a storm. That's not accurate. Jesus did not say, come, follow me. Take, a, take up your, your, your pillow, your blankie, and follow me. Jesus says, come and take up your cross and follow me. He says, look, I, I want to do something in and through your life. And you know what's interesting is that the, the people that follow Jesus physically in this world, the disciples... They followed him. If you look at their life, that Jesus actually led them into some storms. I mean, these are the people that Jesus was closest to. And there were times in their life when they actually were in a storm where Jesus told them, I remember there was one time where Jesus said, hey, I want you to go ahead and cross the Sea of Galilee. So go ahead and cross. And, and uh, he stayed back to pray. And so he sent them across. And while they were going across, a giant storm hit. Now think about it. They were going in the direction that Jesus told them to. And in the going in the direction that Jesus told them to, there was a storm that happened. They didn't want the storm. They were terrified. They thought they were going to die. But that's also the night that they experienced and witnessed Christ walk on water. That was the night that Peter said, Jesus, if it's really you, have me come to you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter got to walk on water. I want you to think about the experience that the apostles, the disciples would have never had if the storm wasn't there. They got to experience so much more. Their faith grew because of what Jesus did in the storm. That can happen in our life. That when the storm hits and you cry out to God, and you say, God, I need you. God, I don't have any answers. God, I don't know what we're going to do. God, I am afraid. And then God gives us the answer. God gives us the direction. And then the storm settles. But you know what we do? We go, oh, cool. That was a coincidence. When God says, you cried out to me and I calmed your storm. See, I think God calms so many storms in our life that we just, we just miss. And when we miss it, we don't even stop to thank him for what he did in that storm. See, what I've realized is this. In the middle of the storms, because Jesus told his disciples something. He says, why are you guys so afraid? He says, you have little faith. Like, why are you scared? What? Yes, the, yes, the storm is happening. I get it. But you know, I already told you, I'm bigger than the storm. I've overcome the storms. I've overcome the issues. You know what he just did there when he said that? He was having them evaluate their faith and their trust in him. That's what storms do in our life too. 
Because I got to tell you, there are times when I've been in my life and I thought, I am, man, my faith and my trust in God, it is solid, it is strong. And then a storm hit and I'm like, ah, what am I going to do? And then I'm reminded, wait a second, do I trust him or not? See, it's an evaluation of our faith and our trust in him. You see, God, he wants heroes. You know that God enables us to be heroic? That, that as Christians, we have an opportunity to go into a world that's broken and to, and to make a difference. I mean, how incredible is that? That God uses us, broken people, imperfect people, and he uses us to make a difference for him. I, I just think that's awesome. But if you think about it, in order to be heroic, there has to be a problem. When you look at heroes, a hero is someone that sees the problem and run towards it. That's what a hero is. Our first responders right now are heroes. I know several people that are, that are at the hospitals, helping people with COVID-19, exposing themselves Yes, they're, 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 they're putting precautions in place, but they're still, instead of running the other way, instead of running into social, social isolation, they're going into work. Why? Because they're pouring into people. They want to help people. Those are heroes. True heroes rise up in the middle of the problem. You know, and the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest heroes of the faith, I love the Apostle Paul. This guy was absolutely incredible. He, he's a guy who wrote most of the New Testament, like literally transformed the world by his writings. This guy was absolutely incredible. Love God, love Jesus. Didn't start that way. He actually wanted to persecute the church. But when he gave his life to Jesus, when he literally had a, a Damascus Road experience, he saw the light, everything changed for him. And this guy was dedicated to changing his world for God. And in doing that and being that hero, he was beaten. He was put in prison. He got bit by a snake. He was whipped. He got hit with stones. They threw stones at him. And this guy who went through all this physical stuff, listen to what he says about the physical stuff in comparison to the big picture. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. So look, all the physical, it's, it's all temporary anyway. Yet inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. God is renewing our soul. He's renewing our character. He's renewing who we are. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory, Light and momentary troubles. That, to me, it always baffles me that he even said that. He said, light and momentary troubles. This is the guy that was beaten, uh, whipped, snake bitten, thrown in prison, hit with stones. I mean, it's crazy. And this guy says, all of that, it's light and momentary compared to this. It is achieving for us the eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not the physical, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, even the pain is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. He said, all the stuff of this life, all the physical, it's all temporary. He says, so because of that, even the pain that we go through, it's temporary so we can endure because we know that in God, there's an eternal glory. There's, we have victory with God. See, he's reminding us here that the storm is not the end. And the apostle Paul went through all kinds of storms in his life. The apostle Paul went through more storms than you and I will ever experience. He did. The things that he went through, you and I will ne probably never experience that in our lives. And he said there, I'm going to focus on the big picture. And I, and I want to show you what he said here, just a few verses before that, okay? So just a few verses before that, that was verses 16 and 18. If you look here in verses 8 and 9, so just same chapter, just a few verses before it, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, he said this, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, 
but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Now, here's what I want you to focus on right there. I want you to focus on the comma. Because when he says here, we are hard-pressed on every side, comma, but not crushed. We are perplexed. We are confused. We, 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 we don't have all the answers. We're, we're wondering why we're so lost. It says, but, comma, but we're not in despair because God is right there with us. See, even when we don't know the outcome, we can trust that God already does. God is all-knowing. It says here, we're persecuted, comma, but not abandoned. You might be persecuted by people in this world. You might, you might have had other people turn their back on you. You might have had other people who didn't like you. Maybe as you're walking in faith and you're walking in your relationship with God, that there, were, there are times when, when the world around you didn't like that. But it says here, but know this, that even though the world will persecute you, you've never been abandoned by God. He has never left your side. He's right there for you to comfort you. He says, you will be struck down. He says, we were struck down. We were knocked down. We, 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 we were going in our purpose and something came and smacked us in the face and dropped us to our knees. He says that in this life, we might be knocked down, but know this, you'll not be destroyed because we have the one who is the overcomer on our side. And if he's the overcomer and he's on our side, we are overcomers. So he says, that is why I can point to it a few verses later and say, all the stuff we go through is light and momentary. So don't ever put a period where God put a comma. See, what this means is this, is that the troubles are not the end of a sentence. It's a comma. The trouble is the beginning of a great story that God is going to do through your life. The trouble side of the comma is the, the fear side. But the promise of God side is the faith side. There's the terror side, and then there's the trust side. And the Apostle Paul says, when it comes to the big picture, heaven outweighs it all, outweighs it all. Let me leave you with this one verse, Revelation 21.4, just to give you a little bit about heaven. It says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain for those first things have passed away. No more sickness. That stuff that you've been carrying, that hurt, there's no more of that. Heaven is a perfect place. And God promises us heaven when we trust him. When we give our life to him, he says, I have something so incredible for you. And Jesus says, right now, you can have peace in the middle of this storm. But here's the way. Go back to the very beginning. It says, in me, in Jesus, you can have peace. You may have it. The way we get peace is by accepting it. By saying, God, I know that it's not about my strength. I know it's not about me. Father, I trust you. Father, I know that you're greater. I know that you're bigger. I know that you're loving. And I trust you with this situation. But the most important thing you could ever trust with God with is your life. God wants to spend eternity with you. Do you know that Jesus Christ came into this world? He died an awful death on the cross to pay the price for our sin so that we can know that for eternity we win. And all we have to do is accept that incredible gift. Maybe right now today you're out there and you're saying, look, I've never accepted that gift. How do I do that? Just ask God. Say, God, I'm sorry that I have not trusted you in my life, but I'm ready to trust you now. God, 
I'm sorry that I've blamed you for the bad. And if that's what you've done and the broken, God, I know that you didn't do this, but thank you that you're our heavenly father and you're still there for us. You're cleaning up the mess that we created. And God, I want to spend not just today with you, but I want to spend eternity with you. You can give your life to Jesus today. Say, God, I'm all yours. And the Bible tells us that your first step of obedience is to, is to be baptized. So if you're ready, you said, I accept God into my life, and you're ready to take your first step of obedience and being baptized, please send us a message. Uh, you can comment on this, or you can send us a, a private message to our, the church page. We will return that message to you. We'll set it up. We're, help, we're here to help you take your next step. Call us at the church office. We are here for you. We love you. And we know that with God, the best is yet to come, church. The best is yet to come. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to thank you so much for today. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity that we get a chance to step back and to remember that you are a loving Father. Father, you created this place, a perfect place, the Garden of Eden, and yet through our free will, we rejected what you said. We, re we went against your warnings, Father, and now we deal with the issues and the problems. And it wasn't just Adam and Eve. Every single one of us, Father, we've all made bad choices. We've, gone, we've all gone in the wrong direction, but we thank you, Father, that you never give up on us. We thank you that you're always there with open arms. All we got to do is turn back to you. Thank you for that promise. Father, thank you for loving us, even though that at times we know it was hard to do because we've done some unlovable things. But we thank you that even though we're, while we were sinners, while we were broken, Father, Jesus Christ came and paid the price for our sin, he, the biggest demonstration of love to bring us back to you. Father, I pray that right now all, over, all around the world that, that we have people that turn their hearts and their life back to you. Father, we know that that's the answer that you're not the cause of problems. You're the answer to them. You're, you're the one that's going to help us. You're, you're the one that's going to fix those things, Father. And I pray that as it said, it's said in 2 Chronicles that we return our heart and our life and we seek your face. And we thank you, Father, that you allow us to do that. I pray for anyone right now, Father, that wants to accept you as their Lord and Savior, wants to accept the incredible gift of salvation, I pray that they just know and they feel how freeing that is, that they've asked you for it. And then, Father, that they reach out so we can help them take their next step in their relationship with you. We thank you so much. We love you, Father, with all of our heart. We praise your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Again, church, I want to thank you so much for joining us here online. I love you like crazy. We, ho we hope to see you guys next week. And don't forget, uh, Monday through Friday, at 7.30 a.m., uh, I do a um, daily devotional with the church. So please join us. It'll be on our Facebook Live. So it's live there on Facebook. I do a daily devotional. The other thing I want to do is I want to give a little shout out to a good friend of mine, Pastor Ryan over at Palm Valley Church uh, in Goodyear, Arizona. Incredible leader, incredible man. Um, and I encourage you, he has a podcast as well, 6 a.m. Monday through Friday. So I encourage you, jump on that podcast. Lots of great wisdom, incredible heart. And again, church, thank you so much. Love you. Have an amazing week.